connection issues. Um, my name is Kevin O'Brien. I'm over in the west of Ireland and I'm just going to turn my camera off very quickly just because we're having a little bit of technical issues. So if we turn off our cameras, it works a little bit better. So I'd like to introduce uh, Julia Silgi, Dr. Julia Silgi from our studio and joining us from Salt Lake City. I'm delighted that you're joining us here. I'm sort of really excited about this topic. And so in that case, I'll actually just hand it over straight away, actually, and let you uh, work away. And thanks for coming. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Let me um, share my screen and get this uh, set up. And I am going to do this this way. And I am going to make sure I can see the chat so that in case anything goes awry, you can do that. Um, uh, I'm really glad that uh, you all are here. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And thank you so much to YR for um, uh, these webinars that have been going on remotely during this time of um, uh, coronavirus. And then um, uh, uh, now um, uh, more. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, world events that are happening. Um, I, so this was the topic that I had ar always planned to speak about during this week um, because uh, it's one of, um, definitely one of my interests. And as I, we talked about um, given events, so I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm a, live in the U.S., um, where we're having um, protests about um, policing, um, about racism uh, here in the U.S. And as we talked about, um, should we put this off to another week? Um, it, you know, is this something people are going to be even interested in? We decided, you know what, um, let's, let's still have this this week because um, so much of what we do as people who work with data does intersect with issues around um, justice and fairness. And the particular, this particular topic is um, extremely relevant to those issues. So I'm happy to be able to talk about something that is one of my interests and that is relative, relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. So I am, um, yeah, so my name is um, Julia Silge. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, word embeddings and un understanding them today. Um, uh, let's see. There we go. Okay, so um, you can find me uh, Twitter and GitHub at these um, links. And this, these are a couple links to my personal website and a website for um, uh, my my book with my co-author Dave on text mining. Um, I'm excited to talk about text because it is one of my uh, interests, and text is something, uh, and text as data is something that we uh, is having so much impact in how we um, in what we're um, uh, in in so many different domains, whether it's um, uh, finance, healthcare, tech, uh, and, and then like actually understanding uh, movements um, in, the, in the world. This um, uh, particular talk that, I, that we're gonna go over today uh, isn't content that's in uh, this book, but instead is a, um, from a new project that I'm working on with a collaborator, um, Emil Wiefeld, that we hope to announce soon. So, um, uh, text is, you know, being generated all the time by all these different processes, um, uh, whether it's, um, you know, people on social media typing in things, as uh, you may have seen, even over the past week, um, protesters sharing um, information, whether it's um, uh, customers, whether it's uh, uh, patients responding to surveys, um, or, or el electronic healthcare records in the time of COVID-19, like text is something, text as data, and enormous quantities of it, and what we're going to do with something is something that is um, just uh, ever more relevant uh, and, and be, being able to have the tools to understand how to, how to, uh, like, what are we going to do with it is, is uh, extremely uh, important. A, a lot of us who work in 
the in, in with data have come up through fields where um, uh, unstructured data was it was not like how we were largely trained we largely were like here is this nice rectangle of data that was made of is made of numbers um and, and so the people who have like computational linguistics training are a tiny minority compared to the people who are on the ground needing to work with data so what we're going to be talking about today specifically is um uh one approach to dealing with data, um, wh which are called word vectors. The, uh, the example that I'm going to walk through here is an example data set that are complaints um, submitted to um, a, um, a government organization in the United States called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, so this is a, a government sort of organization um, uh, established, uh, proposed and established by um, uh, United States Senator and um, former presidential candidate um, Elizabeth Warren. And the idea of this uh, protection bureau was that um, uh, people, regular people could, um, uh, it, it was to protect regular people from like financial, uh, uh, um, when you had a financial um, organizations like banks or credit card companies and something bad had happened to them because of something wrong happening there, this would be a government organization that would protect them. So uh, if you have, if, so if you have lived in the United States and something bad happens to you because of your credit card company or your bank or your mortgage, you can submit a complaint and they go through the complaints and they figure out who did something wrong and resolve these complaints. So, so the, the CFPB actually makes available anonymized, um, uh, makes publicly available anonymized versions of these complaints. So we can, we can read them in. Um, this is a cleaned up version of some of these complaints uh, sit for just since the beginning of like 2019. And we have things like um, uh, date, uh, the complaint ID, um, uh, what kind of product did it belong to, and we also have the complaint narrative. So these are just a couple, but you can give, you can um, uh, kind of see what these are about. Like, I have been a victim of identity theft. Um, I am not able to obtain a credit report. Um, I recently applied for a furniture account. Long story short, I was denied. You know, um, like this company attempts to collect from this many individuals. And so you, this, this is the idea of like, these are what kind of some of these um, complaints are like um, here. And so uh, let's say we have th this text and um, uh, and we want to, we, we need to use this in some way. Say, you know, we just, we started just starting from the beginning, like what's, what is in this text? What is it about? What are people, what are the problems that United States citizens are, are facing in their financial lives? Or say we want to um, uh, train some model with this kind of data. We want to go a step further. Uh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So a, a common approach what like what like what, what how would we represent this kind of data for modeling um this uh let, as we walk through the the code this r code on this slide um this would kind of represent a common way to represent this data for modeling so we start with the data that first line rep represents tokenizing which means breaking the the long text into pieces some kind of tokens. The next line represents removing stop words, things that you maybe aren't you were uh, are maybe interested for interesting for your uh, model. The next line represents stemming, like we go from say uh, plural versions of words to singular versions of words. Um, and then the next line would uh, in the next line we're like counting them up. We're counting them up. Then we. Uh, uh, instead of accounts, we want to represent this using a weight like TFIDF, and then we we transform it into a matrix, um, like a sparse matrix, a sparse matrix. And then we can see here what we have down here at the bottom is a matrix. Um, this particular matrix, like the data set, the subset of the data set that I was looking at here, has something like 67,000 documents, and it's got 34 thousand features and it's 99.8 percent sparse so is this it's this like high dimensional data set it's incredibly sparse um 
and and here we are we it's like time to model this right so this is incredibly challenging um uh the so the so the, when it's like time to try to do some kind of modeling or understand what's in this data we're in this situation where we need to deal with this incredibly sparse data one thing to do one approach of what to do here is to um, it is to we when we have this re representation where we we're faced with these challenges and we say, boy, the, the, all three of these characteristics that we see here um, present uh, enormous challenges for the for a kind of model that we want to um, build. We we would have to build models specially to um, to to address this. So one thing we could do instead of trying to do that is to try to build a new representation for that data. And that is to um, build word embedding. So we take that super sparse, high dimensional space and we embed it into a new space. And we have to have some kind of rules for like, what are we gonna, what kind of new space are we going to take that high dimensional space where, you know, we have all these words and each document is in, you know, like we count up or use TFIDF to say, where are, where are the, each document in this high dimensional space with word, we go to this new space with, um, with like a new embedded space. What, like, what are we gonna use to say what this new space is like? <clears throat> and wh what are we going to use? And we can use rules about, um, uh, one second. Yes. So we can use, we can use rules to build this new space based on how the words are actually used. So this quote is from a, um, a linguist back in the like 60s, like the 1960s, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. And so this is an idea underlying the idea of word embeddings or word vectors, where we decide how to represent a word. We represent a word with a vector of real numbers, and we decide what vector of number, like what the numbers are based on what words are around the other words. So we have this, instead of having like this super high dimensional um, sparse space, we can make a dense space of real numbers and we represent every word in this new dense low dimensional space and we pick them specially based on, by, by looking at how words are used together. So uh, this 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 quote from the 60s was actually about word embeddings, um, uh, like an, an initial early um, idea of of them. Whoops, it clicked out. There we go. Okay, so um, you probably you probably have heard about modern word embeddings. So these are things like word to vec, um, glove, um, fast text, and language models with transformers. So things like um, ULM fit and Elmo. So these are all um, uh, these are all um, uh, <clears throat> uh, examples of word embeddings that are learned from large data sets that take that, that large high dimensional sparse space and get you low dimensional um, vectors, lower dimensional vectors via some kind of math. Um, so so they, they use various different kinds of math, some involving um, uh, deep learning, some, you know, involving various like different parts of the words, you know, whole words, sliding windows, you know, like, like of it, parts of words, like there, there's different kinds of ways of doing it, but they, they all uh, work this way effectively. They all work this way. <clears throat> um, and we can understand how are these working better by looking at them, um, by, by actually learning like how does, what, like what's a sort of first basic way that they work? Because you actually, um, can determine word embeddings just using um, word counts and matrix factorization. So everything on here, everything on this list is like a fancier math version of just using counting words and matrix factorization. So the, um, uh, the, 
what I'm gonna about to walk through in terms of like the approach and the math is very similar to this reference here at the bottom uh, from Chris Moody, um, where uh, you uh, the th like this is the like the baseline simplest approach for finding word embeddings, and it can actually work very well um, in many. Um, in many uh, uh, domains, depending on how much data you have, um, uh, uh, what what kind of problem space you're working in, and what it's really great for is understanding what and word embeddings are and how they work. Okay, so let's say you have text data. The first thing you do is you you tokenize it, and in the approach that I take, we will tokenize it, and then we will transform it to a tidy data structure. So we will here we we take out our text, we tokenize, meaning we're going to break apart that text into single words, and then we're going to we're going to do a filter here so that we're not going to include in our um, in our uh, modeling in our um, representation anything that hasn't been used more than 50 times. So the super rare words we're going to keep out. That would have reduced the dimensionality of the matrix we showed before. So that's good to keep in mind. The, um, so this is the output of that. So we've got, and so in this data set, we have like um, 12 million tokens, not unique tokens, but we've got like 12 million tokens here. Notice that we can see um, how we see a little bit um, here in this example, how this data set is uh, is censored, how they're doing some of their um, uh, pr uh, uh, protection against PII. It's with these X's. So some of our tokens are going to just be just be co combinations of X's in this way. And then we uh, the next thing we can do is we can connect these like create these nested data frames, which are um, each one of the complaints. And then the next thing we need to do is we need to identify these sliding windows to identify um, uh, within what within what window are we going to um, uh, look for uh, basically look at words together. This is something that is not unique to this approach to looking at um, word vectors. If you look at something like um, um, uh, word to vec or something, you have to make a call there as well about how big of a window you're going to look at. So, th so this part right here, you have to decide this with any approach to looking at word embeddings. So the, the little function we're going to use looks like this. So this uses the slider package, which is um, maintained by my coworker, um, Davis Vaughn. And so uh, it is uh, it uses fast functions uh, written in C to, to do sliding operations. And so we make a little window and we slide along our um, text and identify um, windows. We, had, we find all the windows that we, that we uh, are going to look at. So, so when we, if we find the windows, well, we have to decide what, how big is our wing, window going to be. And it turns out that the window size um, d d uh, like is all about what kind of semantic meaning the embeddings uh, capture. So if you go with something like like something on the smaller side, like something like three to four, that focuses on um, how is the word used, and it um, and it will it will the word embeddings that use window size about three to four focuses on like what other words are functionally similar to that word, um, what other words are used in similar ways. If you go to a big window size like ten. Then that will uh, then we with the word embeddings that you get out of that capture the domain or the topic of a word. So the window size that you choose uh, impacts what is it? What kind of like semantic meaning is it that your embeddings capture? Um, and okay, so we we um, we have a function that slides along and finds windows. And after we do that, we calculate the pointwise mutual information. So that um, what that's doing is it uh, it answers the questions how so it takes the question how often do words um, occur on their own? Like some words are very common, some words are rare, more rare, and then how often do words 
does a word occur together with other words? So it, it, it basically, um, uh, it, it's a measure of association and it answers these questions like how often, uh, like how likely is a word occur to occur with another word um, um, when we, uh, when we con um, control for we or we account for how common the word is overall. So the point wise mutual information is, um, is, is this, it's the logarithm of the probability of finding two words together normalized for the probability of finding each of the words alone. Um, so once we have, um, okay, so, so yeah, so this code uh, take those nested words. Um, we we slide along. We find all of the um, all of the windows. Here I'm using a window size of four. So remember that's on the smaller side where we want to um, uh, more find words that are functionally similar, words that are used in similar ways. Then we um, we find we get a new uh, we make a new ID column that's like a window. So we're finding the windows, not just the complaints. And then we calculate we calculate within a window what's the pairwise PMI. So for all words that we find together in the same windows, what is this? We measure this like which words occur together more often than expected based you know, on how common they are overall. So that gives us uh, an output like this. So when PMI is high, like a bigger number, uh, two words are associated with each other. So we've got um, like on and 2019. So um, uh, people were saying like dates, and they're more likely to use the word, the preposition on with dates. And then we've got some negative things like I and on were no, not likely to come within four words of each other because that's like a negative number there. So that then we find the word vectors. And word vectors, um, all you have to do is take, is do some like linear algebra. It's just a singular value decomposition of that, that those, val those PMI values. So you, you do, here I'm using, um, so this is a sparse, this is still very sparse. And we, so the widely SVD is like, uses I, the IRLBA package under the hood. And so it does a, um, it does a uh, uh, sparse aware, uh, singular value decomposition. And what you get out here is actually word vectors. So the dimension here, so here we're by NV equals 100, I'm finding 100 word vectors, 100 dimensional word vectors. So the dimension here is um, the, uh, the which word vector it is, and the item is the word, and the value there is what real number, what real number do we do, like goes, what's the contribution of that, wor of that word in that, uh, in that dimension there? So, so after we did that, we did that math, each word can be represented as a numeric vector in this new space. So we had this super, this super high dimensional sparse space and this new space is dense and it's hundred dimensional because that's what, that's what I said I wanted to make was a hundred dimensional feature space. So, um, so that's great, we did it, we found ver word vectors. That's pretty exciting. So let's explore them a little bit. So let's, um, Let's uh, use this function to explore it a little bit. Um, uh, this little function, what it does is it, um, it asks which words are close to each other um, in this new feature space. So we have this new hundred dimensional feature space and it does, it just does like a, um, uh, like a, a dot product to find um, which words are closer to each other in this new feature space of word embeddings. So let's go back, let's remember, what was this data again? CFPA, CFPB um, complaints. People writing to Elizabeth Warren saying, this bad thing happened to me in my financial life. So what's the, the closest words to the words error? So issue, problem, errors, system, mistake, correct, incorrect. So these are the words that are the closest here, the words that are used the most similarly. Makes sense, sounds good. Um, month, so month, months, year, payment, payments, years, amount, 
pay monthly. So, so notice a couple of things. Notice we did not stem. We did not stem these words, but the words got put together anyway. Um, so the so a so word embeddings will learn things that belong together if they belong together. So if words like month and months are used together, they will get put together um, uh, even if you do not stem them. Um, in this in this data set, payment um, and payments are really close to words uh, to month. Um, let's look at fee charge, interest, late charges, overdraft. This is what people use um, in similar ways that they use the word fee in this data set of, um, of, um, of CFPB complaints. All right, nice. Um, one thing that is nice about this approach where you, um, you're just using singular value decomposition to get to this is that um, you actually get the components out, like principal components out. So for example, here's the first eight. So what we're looking at here is what words contribute the most, have the biggest contributions to the first eight um, uh, principal components in, in this. Uh, so the first one is most about like consumer reporting. Um, the second one is in the opposite direction, but it looks like it's about kind of dates probably and credit account. Um, no, you can tell here that we did not remove stop words, but it, it, we could perhaps argue that we're learning things about how stop words are used. So for example, um, uh, I think that, um, maybe it's on the next slide. Okay, so first notice how all those numbers are used very similarly to each other. So that is something interesting to see. Uh, okay, so yeah, I think here is where it is. So the, um, <clears throat> the so I in notice in number 13 we we're notice like which words that are often considered stop words are used in different ways so stop words um uh one could argue are not non-informative but are informative in different ways than words we often consider stop words are so like was letter received is sent be very like these those are a lot of words that are often considered stop words, but they are, they are associated with like letter received, sent, you know, like they're being used in interesting ways. Um, and uh, you would might say the same thing about 12 with like home um, here. So, so this is something we get out for free is like this interpretability of the, um, uh, of the, um, of the vectors when we, um, when we use this approach, but um, oh yes. Okay. So, so we use the, we, we, um, we made these models, we made these vectors. How do we use them in modeling? So the a classic and simplest approach is to treat each document as, as a collection of words. And we just summarize word embeddings into document embeddings. You can do that using either taking a sum or taking a um, mean. And I think in this approach, I, I counted them. So that makes it a um, sum. And we, we just do a matrix multiplication and we get out. So this would be a, this would be, um, uh, we're just, we, we, so notice instead we only have a 100 dimensional matrix. So for each document now we have a document embedding. So it's the same number of documents we had before, but they're only a hundred dimensional. And so we could use that as input to some kind of model if we wanted, instead of having, you know, like the 37,000 dimensions, now we only have a hundred dimensions. So that was great. That worked really well, right? but I had 12 million tokens. Like I had a ton of tokens. What do you do if your data set is too small? If you don't have enough data to build good quality, um, uh, you don't have enough to build good quality uh, uh, word vectors. Uh, you need, I mean, there's no hard and fast rules, but people, the sort of guideline is you need like a million tokens roughly to build um, good quality uh, word vectors. So if you don't, if your data set is too small, you can turn to, um, you can try pre-trained word embeddings. So some of these are available in the text data package. Um, one like common one is um, our glove embeddings. There's a ton out there, right? But the glove, this is the glove 6B uh, data set, which is um, 
trained uh, using 6 billion tokens. That's what it is. That's what that means. It's largely trained on like Wikipedia plus I think like some like they've they've augmented Wikipedia with some other things. And since I made 100 dimensional ones before, let's get 100 dimensional ones here. So the output looks like this. Um, right now it's in like a wide form. Um, we can uh, transformer it and get like a tidy form here and it will look like this. So this is like an, an analogous structure to what we had before. Let's do the same thing we did before and um, look at some of those same words. So let's look at um, error. So error, what do we have here? Data, inning, game, unforced, fault, point. So I want you to imagine that we're going back to that CFPB, um, though that data, and we like we instead of training our own embeddings, we decided to use pre-trained embeddings, and um, uh, these words, these closest words here, are words that are about like sports and baseball, I think. <laughs> I'm not a big baseball person. But um, uh, so this is an example of um, the pre-trained embeddings um, are giving us, I guess we could call this like a false positive kind of problem. Let's look at months. So month, year, last week, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, Thursday, percent. So remember when we trained our own embeddings, months had words in it like payment, um, uh, you know, like, like words about like my monthly payment. Um, and so this would be an example of like, kind of like a false negative kind of problem we would get if we used pre-trained embeddings. Um, and then fee was the other one we looked at. And we have like fee, fees, salary, payment, tax. Um, so the CFPB complaints like aren't about salaries or taxes, right? And they're, and like, it's a U.S., data set, so there's certainly no pound symbols in it. So um, what, so pre-trained embeddings are amazing, right? Like they are, um, they are truly astounding. They encapsulate like all of the semantic meaning of Wikipedia in them, right? But depending on your problem space, um, you may be running into ways in which they do not um, fit your needs. Um, they, they, these pre-trained word embeddings um, do truly um, have in them very rich semantic relationships. So, for example, like this is amazing, right? Like that we've learned that month is closest to week and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Like, like there's incredibly rich semantic relationships in there, but it um, may be less than ideal depending on the kind of problem that you're kind of trying to solve. Um, so how would we integrate pre-trained word embeddings into modeling? Um, it turns out you, we can do just the same thing that we did with the kind of, um, the kind of uh, word embeddings that we made. You can, there are more complicated approaches, but you, we, can we can create just simple document embeddings by summarizing using either a sum or a mean. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that the glove embeddings don't contain all the tokens. Um, there's not like overlap there um, and vice versa. So we have to do we have to do a little bit of some like inner joins where we didn't have to do inner joins before. Um, and we lose a few documents because some of the documents didn't have any of the work, any of the tokens that were there. But we do end up with um, 100 dimensional uh, 100 feature, 100 dimensional features again. All right, so um, uh, word embeddings are a, an effective way to take a high dimensional space, sparse space, and project them, project it down to a dense, lower dimensional space that we can use um, for modeling or other purposes. But it is important to understand what the ramifications of doing this are. So um, embeddings, uh, you just saw us do it, right? Or you just saw me do it, are trained or learned from a, a large corpus of text data. It doesn't work unless you have a lot of text data. And um, it, is, it is true of basically all machine learning that um, the, the 
the impact, the output of machine learning is um, exquisitely sensitive to whatever is um, uh, what whatever is uh, the the structure, the the information, the in, the biases that are um, that are baked in to your training data. But this is um, this is. Uh, in, this is never more true in, 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 than in um, uh, word embeddings. Uh, text is generated by human beings and well, largely, right? And um, uh, uh, t uh, bias, prejudice, I, you know, uh, any ideas that you may not actually want um, that are in the corpus become imprinted into the embeddings like they they become baked in to the embeddings so um uh, he here are some examples uh so uh like african-american first names <clears throat> are associated with more unpleasant feelings than european american first names so what what i mean by that is um they are if you look in the vector space uh like uh, black uh, first names used for black Americans are closer to like, like negative feeling words than um, names used for like white Americans. Um, women's first names are closer in the vector space with words about like family and home and men's first names are more associated with words about work and career. Um, terms associated with um, women are more associated with like uh, the the arts and terms associated with men are more associated with science. So, um, like there are uh, there are like this has been um, confirmed multiple times and studied well that uh, when we take these um, when we take these large data sets from which often are, for example, like some common ones are like the Google News data set or Wikipedia. Um, because of the processes that generated those texts, um, uh, then the, and then we, if we, when we learn word embeddings from them, um, uh, the, the, the biases and the text gets imprinted into the word embedding. Um, here and then, what happens when we use it? We 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 it then gets we then amplify, and like uh, we, what happens is it gets amplified and concentrated in a model. So this is an example from I believe twenty sixteen. I have the date. I can I can share that. But so this is um, an example that happened in Google Translate. Um, they they have since fixed this problem, but you know new ones kind of pop up here and there. So so Turkish is gender neutral. Uh, there's there's no new there's no gendered pronouns, and um, when you translate from the from Turk at the time when you translated from Turkish to English, um, you we you ended up with these results. You know she is a cook, but he is an engineer. He is a doctor, but she is a nurse. And the reason we get these results is because of um, the the kinds of biases we just were talking about that um, that uh, to make the, to do this kind of you know translations we're relying on large training data sets that um, that that had biases ingrained in them and then and then a model based on it um, reproduces it but also, amplifies it and um and uh uh it gets it gets condensed down so it so it turns out <laughs> that when it comes to word embeddings the bias in it is so ingrained it's so much a part of word embeddings that you can use bias in word embeddings to quantify social attitudes over time I'm just going to say that again because it's so incredible like bias in word embeddings is so much baked into what they are that you can you you can measure bias in word embeddings and you can use it to quantify change in social attitudes over time 
So this is a great paper and um, it looked at what texts over time and looked at changes in like attitudes about race, ethnicity and gender over time by looking at uh, how word embeddings, how bias and word embeddings changed. Okay, so, so yeah, this happens because of these biased um, training data sets. So um, they come from these large data sets of text data. So um, the glove, the glove 6B um, data sets that we looked at comes from Wikipedia. And so uh, it, these, these data sets um, uh, often have a problem where they are both reflecting social historical bias and generating bias through the, um, the what's going on in how that data set is generated. So for example, like one response to this might be like, well, you know, that's just um, like, 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 okay, yeah, like women, like we have, we have a, a, you know, we get these results and like, like women's names are most associated with more associated with family and home and men's are more associated with like work and career. Like that's the way things have been. Like, don't blame the, you know, like don't blame the messenger kind of situation. But the, but the, uh, a, a challenge there is that the, that our data sources often come from um, pro are often being from data generating processes that have a two, two, two things going on. They are reflecting social historical biases, but they're also generating bias through what is going on uh, in that situation as well. Um, okay, and then what happens when we use that in a model? Um, what happens when we use that in the model is that the, the bias gets um, the um, gets amplified and condensed down. So there's a for, and from 2017. There's like a really straightforward example where you try to um, where this person walked through how they uh, tr uh, trained a straightforward sentiment analysis model. Um, very straightforward and a, a simple text like let's go get Italian food um, was scored much more highly than let's go get Mexican food. It uses it, it uses these um, data sets that uh, largely were generated in the United States, um, uh, where um, discussion around immigration and individuals from Mexico involved you know, negative words. And so these things that should be, you know, both should be the same or neutral, um, you end up with this this problem in in the model. All right, so what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do about this? What is it that we are gonna do and move forward? So one thing is to uh, find your own embeddings, learn your own embeddings rather than use pre-trained ones. Um, uh, any large data set is going to have in it the, um, the, uh, the biases of the people who generate it, but if you use your own, define your own instead of using a pre-trained data set, you're at least not adding in um, systemic and historical bias from another source. So that's one idea to consider. Um, consider not using embeddings. Um, in the problem space you are working in, um, uh, it may be possible instead to go back to that sparse representation and to use a, um, to weight by TFA IDF, you know, use um, bigrams, trigrams, use a model built for sparse data, um, perhaps with regularization or something like there may be another option for your modeling. Um, and then there's the question, can embeddings be debiased? Is it possible to take the embeddings, learn them, and then correct them after the fact. So um, here are some ways that people have worked to debias embeddings. You can take the so it's this is like like uh, vectors, right? Like in a high dimensional space, um, you can reproject them to mitigate a specific bias. Um, using specific sets of words. So people have mostly done this with gender. So they take like the list of words like um, aunt, uncle, grandmother, grandfather, 
um, wife, husband, you know, like they take lists of paired words and then um, mathematically reproject so that the, this long list of paired words um, do are debiased. So that's that's one thing that has been tried. Another thing that has been tried is um, uh, you take your training data and you augment it with counterfactuals. And so this means you take the words about, you take the sentence, you take your data with the word, the sentences about women being such good homemakers and you add sentences about men being just really excellent homemakers. Um, uh, other researchers say that the, the if you wanna be fair, um, you, you measure bias and then make a correction at the decision point. Um, you don't mess with the model, like make the correction at the point of decision, not in the model. And um, the reason like why those people make that is because they're somewhat skeptical about ideas about debiasing. And um, the like the most recent work is that um, like all the evidence so far indicates that all debiasing methods so far allow stereotypes to seek seep back in. Um, like if you do that sort of forced debiasing, um, it just it just goes back in. You like like it, it, it like in the other in in other words. So you you don't you don't actually help the situation. There's a wonderful paper with a wonderful title called "Lipstick on a Pig: Debiasing Methods Cover Up Systemic Gender Biases in Word Embeddings but Do Not Remove Them." And when you if we want to move past gender as like the thing we care about in terms of fairness, um, uh, like like th we like this this community has not even really begun to wrestle with that when it comes to issues of race or ethnicity or sexuality. So um, uh, so uh, what do we do with world word embeddings in the real world? Um, when I have um, used them or uh, experimented with them. I think the best uses of them have been with um, uh, situations where people have domain specific problems um, and uh, they need to create them for themselves. I think it's been really interesting to see them as measures of bias. And I think that it will be super interesting to see like more work done into whether debiasing can work. So I'm excited to see further work in that field. And with that, I will say um, thank you very much and see if there are some questions. Thank you for that, Julia. That was a great talk. Um, well, yes, we've actually had quite a lot of questions and from the floor. I'll just actually open them up uh, in shortly. But actually, just to sort of, um, we can talk a little bit more about the uh, uh, historical biases and so on. Uh, for uh, that, That's a very interesting topic, actually. So I just actually wonder what, how, you know, uh, what we can do right now. How do these bi biases might manifest today? And what do we look out for? Uh, from the point of view of algorithms and machine learning and stuff like that and how they exist in our day-to-day -day lives right now. Oh, uh, okay. So beyond word embeddings, but in other areas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I think there are some really uh, fantastic books that address this in um, a great deal of detail. I think that... Um, uh, I mean, one that I read and think is fantastic, it's called Algorithms of Oppression. And I would, I, the person, um, Sophia Noble, who wrote that is an expert and um, uh, has a lot to say about that. I think that, um, uh, I, I mean, I think that as people who work in data, like learning more about this is really important. And um, um, uh, so, so I think when we, um, some things I think to be aware of and watch out for are, for example, ways in which our things that we use as predictors end up as from a, as backdoors, right? For thing, because I don't think many of us are gonna like put in, <clears throat> oh, race and be like, well, 
uh, we're going to make some very overtly wrong choice. But to instead understand how our um, how our in, in unwillingness to kind of ask questions about our our like how are the the models that we train impacting people or the business models of our companies working um, uh, the, the, those those more subtle questions can be very helpful. That wasn't the clearest answer, but. I know it's really an open question for everyone to look at, really, isn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, that's it. Yeah, no, it's actually, I was just maybe just a sort of remark to everyone else that there's a lot of uh, good reason. Uh, the, the, the questions are being tackled quite a lot. And I know there's lots of communities on Twitter like uh, Queer in AI, and I think it's. Uh, Black in AI, I, I don't yeah. communities, and they, 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 they will actually are uh, Latins in AI. So a lot, and they all have Twitter accounts, and they all will have a disability in AI, and they all will be uh, looking at these issues from their point of view. So, yeah, that's great. Um, just a, uh, just actually, just a sort of like historical biases. Uh, have you, have you ever, has it, have, have, do you know any, um. But, uh, works that have been or like uh, projects to look at historical biases in the past and uh, like I was very interested in what you sort of said there about the connection between women and art and men and science uh, you know it's uh, um, yeah so the yes I can find let me drop that um, that um, reference up here and we can we can see what that one is. I get that reference for you. Okay. If I did not have it on the slides, I can get oh, yeah, that one. Okay. Sorry, actually, that's all right. The 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 uh, the, the, the uh, slides will be uh, there. Sorry, just for the folks at home, I switched off my camera because I'm just having um, uh, malfunctions with it. Uh, I'll just ask some technical questions. We've got to ask some technical questions there. Yeah. Uh, Donald O'Donnell just uh, made a comment. I think it was about window size. Is it related to the complexity of the text or judgment of the author? Um, so it's related to, so, so what, so what I said in the slides is somewhat English specific. Um, and so would need to be probably reevaluated for other languages, but it's related to it. To what I said was somewhat not is not related to the complexity of the text. It's somewhat standard over English text in general, but like, um, if you go big, you end up learning like uh, things about the topic. And if you go small, you end up learning like words that are that are similar. There's a, um, I can maybe find this and we can add it to some link somewhere, but there's a, there's a nice um, talk that's more Python centric that kind of evaluates this uh, and kind of shows some differences um, for one of the Python um, word vector implementations that kind of shows this and it's, it's pretty, interesting to kind of see how it changes as you change the window size, what kind of information you get out. So, so no, it's, it's related. It, that doesn't change very much to, um, it doesn't change very much on the kind of text because it's somewhat related to like the characteristic of English as a language and how people use it. Okay, cool. So uh, Jeff Bricker has uh, uh, contributed a few questions here. Um, does stop word removal affect the accuracy of the embedding? And does it sort of, yeah, that one, we'll go with that one first. Yeah, no, you, you can remove stop words from before you do embeddings, then you, um, you know, you can like have word embeddings that don't include stop words. Um, and, and then you just don't have that information in the word embeddings. Um, you, uh, in word embeddings, I'm sorry, stop words are not non-informative. They're, they are like per, per word, you know, like less informative than non-stop words. It's more like a, it, I, it, you know, it's, it's more like a spectrum, right? Like, it's not like 
here are the informative words and here are the not ones. And we can just cleanly slice these off. Right. And so um, I did purposely leave everything in here um, to show how, oh, actually, like these are being used quite differently and are in the space in certain ways. But certainly, certainly they can be taken out and make things train faster um, and uh, uh, that is certainly that is certainly an option. Okay, uh, just a follow up question uh, there. Uh, just uh, just really a sort of a, a quick high level overview of how to cluster embeddings was the follow up question. So word embeddings are um, vectors, uh, new real of real numbers, and so you can use basically any you know approach you would use to cluster vectors of real numbers to um, to to do that. Um, they're like that's the idea of them is that you represent them in um, uh, is that you represent them as real numbers. The so so there's some people though who who say that um, when it comes to language, if you want to like find things that are documents that are similar to each other, it would be better to take a language aware modeling approach, like topic modeling, which is a, is very different than what we've been talking about today. And if, so, so, and it, it's like a mixed model, like you model documents as a mixture of topics and topics as a mixture of words. Um, and so like, that's, that's an entirely different sort of approach to that like if you're like I want to cluster documents together like so some some people in this computational space would say like that's the right call on how to um, find similar documents but um, uh, certainly that's part of the point of finding um, of finding word embeddings is so that you just have real numbers and then you can do with them anything you would do with real numbers. Okay, um, another follow-up question um, from several uh, questions related to language, working with different languages. For example, uh, is there uh, the, an adjustment needed for languages from different language groups? For example, word order is essential in some languages. Right. Um, so, okay, I think the thing to think about that's important is the window size. Um, and the because uh, there are differences in um, how sentences are even arranged um, and may and to the tokenizer tokenization is quite different. So some of those steps that were taken it to create uh, word vectors are steps that are language or specific. So tokenization, for example, is very different when you move to um, uh, uh, languages, the languages of Asia. Um, uh, there are, um, when you come to uh, languages that arrange their grammatical structure differently than English, um, you there would be different semantic meaning learned from different window sizes. Okay, um, that's great. Um, they, uh, one of the uh, people on the, uh, the, the uh, sorry, just a quick question here. I wonder about the human use of indirect speech act, acts, the use of irony, understatement, overstatement, and uh, reversal of meaning and so on. Language tricks. So can you just wonder if there's that, can that be captured by modeling? Yes. Um, so most, um, most corpuses of language don't have, like, as a proportion of language, um, Thing, if you mean things like sarcasm or um, possibly, yeah, yeah, like like most most um, like language in general doesn't contain that in in like pr high proportion. And if you think about it, that makes sense because it wouldn't like language would be 
like not functional if we did that, right? Like we wouldn't be able, <laughs> wouldn't be able to yeah. communicate very well unless that was like the exception rather than the rule. Um, uh, and I mean, I've seen people, I've seen like things here and there about like trying to detect sarcasm. Um, and that certainly I think is an open problem, like an unsolved open problem. Um, I, yeah, yeah. This so these are certainly like statistical, like learning statistical uh, characteristics of language. Okay, um, just another one here. If you remove stop words, uh, change grammaticals uh, that change the grammatical structure of the sentence, does that affect affects the embedding of the remaining relevant words? Um, so stop word. So if you remove stop word, so, okay, you slide a window along, you identify words. Um, if you remove stop words, stop words again, um, it, it would, it will change the meaning of your window by a little bit, but stop words are not typically a huge, um, hmm, well, they are common. I guess it would adjust what that would adjust what your window means a little bit it would adjust what your min window means a little bit but it will not um uh it would not it would not change the um so it would slightly adjust the semantic meaning of what the word embeddings mean because it would slightly adjust like your effective window size okay that's good uh one last technical one and i'll just move over to some other questions then how would you evaluate between different word embedding models? Okay, this is an open question. This is an open question. So people have tried to um, evaluate using these like analogy tests. And um, then other people say it's they're like those analogy tests are nonsense um, and like whether those analogy tests are even meaningful at all. So this is an entirely open question that has not been decided on by the like computational linguistics community at all. Um, so yeah, yeah, like whether there, I said you need a million tokens to make good quality um, uh, word embeddings, but there's like no agreement whatsoever on like what good quality word embeddings, what that means, like what that means. Uh, that's great there. Sorry about that, folks. My camera's a bit better now. I fixed the lighting in here. Um, I'm going to switch to some um, other types of questions. So, uh, Julia, you're over in Salt Lake City, and I know it's a tumultuous time over there. How are you getting on? Um, I would say... Um... I, I think it's a time when most people, like most people, I wouldn't say I'm like, oh, everything's fine and great. I um, am, my, I mean, my, my family is healthy and safe. And so that's good. That my, there have been um, protests in my city um, and uh, like, and I am uh, really, thankful to see that even my city, which is not um, a huge hotbed of um, a central hotbed, it is a city where people um, care about um, uh, justice and um, more fairness and policing. And like my family and I went to a demonstration Tuesday night. And so pretty well, I would say. I mean, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I, it's hard to answer that question right now. Um, understandably so. I know it's uh, uh, a lot going on over there. Um, so the tell us about um, maybe a bit about your careers o over the last how how you got started. Like you don't you didn't start in statistics or mathematics. You had a different back. You came from a different place. That's true. My academic background is in physics and astronomy, and um, I was in academia for a while, teaching and doing research, and then had a somewhat circuitous route, um, doing working at like a couple startups, doing random stuff. And about five years ago, I transitioned into data science. Um, so I am <clears throat> largely self-taught, actually, when it comes to. Um, statistic, formal statistics, uh, I uh, sometimes I feel really aware of that, like I'll come up on like holes in my formal statistics knowledge, but it's I 
um, uh, I, I enjoy, I, I'm, I am always someone who's really enjoyed like learning new things. And, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, I like, I like try to be filling those holes as much as possible and keep, keep reading and learning. Right. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, I just actually a question that I just thought to ask if there's any substantial corpus of text that you'd like to have a look at. I know a lot of people are sort of very interested in things like Game of Thrones and stuff like that and Star Trek or other, other, uh, something like that. I just wonder, is that anything you sort of really think? And I'm going to have a look at that sometime. Well, actually, um, <coughs> one of the one of the interns at our studio this summer um, I just suggested a project for us to work on together. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, he said that he has a all of the um, like 30 years of the R help mailing lists um, scraped and available together for like for like topic modeling and text analysis. And and I was like, oh, man, that would be so interesting, be so interesting, both for understanding um, like how has R changed over time, how like what kinds of questions have people had um, also kind of like how were how did um uh like how, w when did people sort of like move from email to other kinds of um uh areas for getting help um how did uh how did different contributors change over time or I, I and i was like oh man yeah that's a great data set to be able to understand kind of this community that we're all a part of That's a fantastic answer. I'm, uh, that, that, uh, that that is actually really good. Actually, that 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 would um, that would be paint a very interest a, a very perfect history of the R project over the last. That's a really great answer. Actually, I have to think more about that one. Actually, yeah. Um, so actually, I'm, I know you're also involved in the R community and user groups and R ladies and stuff like that. How is that? How's your interactions with that going along at the moment? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I'm locally here in Utah. I'm um, one of the organizers for our local our user group. And um, we've moved to, you know, online meetups much like this via Zoom. And that has been an interesting transition, but has... Um, uh, you know, it is what it is. And I've been really thankful for speakers who have been willing to be flexible. And just last week, we had a really interesting meetup with one of our um, local a data scientists who's a, a who works at our local community college, which is um, uh, for I, it's like a two year institution, higher ed institution. I'm not, I, I always get fuzzy on differences in educational systems like Europe versus US. Anyway, she gave a great talk. So it's been interesting to kind of like transition during this, um, this, uh, this time. But so, th so that's interesting. I it's interesting to be involved locally in the meetup because I work remotely now and actually have worked remotely for a number of years. So I'm glad to be involved in the local meetup scene for data and R specifically because um, it's really nice to have those local connections when um, uh, my work tends to be, um, uh, you know, mediated all the time by screens and across time zones and um, and long distances. Great stuff. Uh, there's two questions on the YouTube channel. Uh, I'll, I'll do the, what is the current development and future of the tidy text package? And, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So one, um, one idea, one thing that's kind of rattling around is um, uh, um, getting some better um, tutorial materials out there. Um, I'm really excited about uh, Learn R, which is um, a package for like interactive tutorials. Um, I, I recently just like revamped one more time the um, the, uh, the supervised machine learning course that I had developed. And I, I have like another course that's just kind of sitting fallow right now with like data sets I like and, you know, work that, that I liked and I would like to redo it and maybe make it, you know, in one of these sort of self-contained environments that people can either install locally or like access to the browser, both, you know, like that you can do both with LearnR, which is really exciting. And the, the other thing is um, uh, STM, the topic modeling package that is my current like 
recommended. Like, I really like it. Um, the, some of our uh, vignettes and docs and whatnot um, are a little out of date and don't really show how to use that package as well, including maybe some functions for really making it easy to train um, many topic models at once to be able to, for example, find the best value of K um, for like the number of topics for large data sets. Great stuff. Um, the just a sort of a little sort of a quick question there. I just one was about how about MATLAB, that, but I'm also going to join it with how about the Julia programming language? Surely that has piqued your interest <laughs> with your background in physics, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I am a little bit older on the older side, actually. So my original, like way back in the day, I, I was like a C person, like that was my my um like introduction to like what did i do all my like programming and data were you know my 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 coding for when back in the day was all that and so i think um i think if i were to uh because of that background like if i were to need to write like something faster i would probably be more likely to um brush up on and like get that if i needed to write fast code i would probably write c rather than learn julia but just because of my um my background um but it is i think very interesting also to think about when i think about my own sort of computational background like or journey one might say um to think about um uh, our, our real strength and like what R is and does is this uh, interface between like me or us like as uh, data scientists, data analysts, like people like human beings uh, who are writing code and um, uh, at, at performant code like, or like some kind of um, uh, engine, uh, it, whether that's C or Stan or, um, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, I mean, P Python when it comes to reticulate and Keras or, you know, like any of these sort of um, uh, examples we have of uh, it are being this um, fluent, um, efficient bridge between um, uh, us like needing to write code to, to, you know, say, here's what I need you to do. And this less fun to write um, uh, other language. And so it's interesting. And, and it's really interesting, actually, since like, that's kind of my day job now, right, is um, in the tidy models ecosystem, like that's what we're all about, right, is like making the ability to write machine learning code or modeling code in our ecosystem fluent and um, low friction and to smooth out these heterogeneous um, uh, 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 interfaces that we have. There's been quite a bit of development in that uh, with tidy models lately. I think, believe there's a course online now, is that right? Um, yeah, okay, so yeah, there's two, uh, I mean, there'd be two resources I point folks to right now. Um, uh, one is our fairly recently um, new site, uh, tidymodels.org. I am really proud of it, <laughs> to be honest. Um, we So it has a, a section called Start, which has like five articles that walk you through how to get started with tidy models. And then there's another section, Learn, that has um, uh, more detailed articles of like more focused, like, um, like specific task specific things, kind of things that you want to do. Um, and then I think another, yeah, another resource would be um, that that course that I mentioned that I recently relaunched using tidy models. Uh, so it's like a supervised machine learning course um, using tidy models. Great stuff. Uh, sorry, just another question just came up there at the end on YouTube. Are there any reading materials that you would recommend for the understanding a better under, uh, theoretical understanding of word embeddings. One of the other contributors has just, uh, other uh, attendees has just said, uh, neural, network, neural network methods for natural language processing by Yoav Goldberg. Are just any others there? Yeah, okay, so um, <clears throat> um, I think this is a little bit 
to to be TBD um, because I'm I'm working on a new project um, that's going to be announced soon um, with some more resources that will that will cover some of this. So um, we're gonna have that out hopefully hopefully soonish hopefully soonish when we talk about. Um, a little bit, a little bit more of that with references, but um, the um, let's see. Do I have anything off the top of my head in terms of um, in terms of uh, word embeddings? I do. I mean, so the the um, the slides that I showed, they had the we can. I mean, if you if you you know go back yeah. and see they they have the URL at the bottom that has the slides where you can go to them and I had a number of references throughout um, the talk and a lot of those references are really great for understanding um, word embeddings. Great, thank you very much. Uh, you're also uh, just uh, you're on Twitter as well, Julia Silgi. Uh, that's right. That's right. So this is sort of like your uh, a lot of your. Uh, resources can be found by following you following you online yeah. on the Twitter. Yes, there. that's right. That's right. Julia, I think we'll call it a day. I think we've done a lot of uh we've covered a lot of ground here. In fact we're over by 15 or 20 minutes actually and we better let you go. But thanks for coming and again we really appreciate you joining us uh particularly you know with a, a very busy a very dramatic and stressful and painful week that's going on in the USA and thank you for joining us from Salt Lake City. And also just to sort of uh, to say to everyone in the USA that everyone else in the world is uh, thinking about you and hoping that, you know, everyone is, will be safe over there and that we all have a good future together uh, in the R community and professionally as data scientists and so on. And that we'll all we'll, we'll, we'll return to having a, a very optimistic future. Um, but I think we'll leave it there. If that's that sounds great. That. Thank you so much for having me. That's great. All right. Um, just to say to everyone else, uh, thank you for joining us as well. And we'll be delighted to uh, host you in the future, hopefully. Uh, everyone in the world, I was just noticing that we have people from five continents uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the chat there. So people in North America, South America, Africa, Asia, and Europe, you know, uh, we, we're all one big community. And we all hope that we, like, we'll all join in this uh, YR project together and that we'll be hosting more talks from all over the world in the future. So I think that we'll leave it on that note there and just to say thank you to everyone. Okay, I think we'll end it there. Thanks, bye-bye.